No one's waiting. Close the chat. And we can start. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, I was called pinch hitting for yesterday, I mean, to do the class. So I want to pick a topic that's sort of fun. It relates to Sefer Breshit. And since we're all Zionists and it's a Zionist organization, I wanted to do a class on the connection between the geography of Israel and how an understanding of geography of Israel can help you understand a lot of key events in Sefer Breshit. Got that? My connection's okay? You guys here? Okay, good. I see Donnie. Already. Um, so here's what we're going to do. First, I'm going to share you a, a little map of Israel. I have a couple maps. We have a lot of maps to share today. Um, I want to talk about, actually, before I show the map, I want to talk about where our forefathers are living. You want to watch it? Let me go a second. Okay. Mute everybody. Okay. I put a mute on everybody. If you want to unmute, just hit the thing. Um, so what I wanted to do was explain, there's a certain phenomena where Avram Avinu, when he first makes Aliyah, first he goes to Shechem, then he goes to Beit El, then he travels to Elon More, later we find him in Beersheba. Uh, Yitzchak is living, uh, probably, in, it seems like he's living in Hebron. For a while he goes to Grar when, he's, um, when there's a bit of a famine in the land. Um, Yaakov leaves from Beersheba, and this week's Pasha, Yaakov leaves from Beersheba and goes to, on his way to Haran, he stops in Bethel. When Yaakov comes back, he pretty much comes back the same way Avram first came. First he comes to Shechem. I'm sure you remember that. When Yaakov returns, when he gets to Israel, first he goes to Shechem. Shechem, that was an incident there. From Shechem, he travels to Bethel. And then we find later on, he's living in Hebron. When they sell, when they're, uh, when they sell Yosef, he's living in Hebron. So I'm going to show you a map real fast. Let me show the screen first. And let's get to this one. And here we go. I'm sure you're familiar with the map. You guys nice see it nice and big? What I want to show you, the cities of, the, of our forefathers, they're right along the top of the mountain range. You guys all live in Baca area, pretty much, where, where the show is. You live very close to Dera Hebron. What's Dera Hebron? Then Hebron is simply the top of this mountain range. I'll get my little marker here. Um, I don't have a marker. That's not good. Oh, that's not good. I can't use a marker. Where's Natan? Okay, I'll, I'll just use my mouse, I guess. We'll be able to see it. You guys see my mouse going around? Maybe yeah. my highlighter? Yeah. The highlighter. Yes, helping. we see. Yes. Okay, I have a little bit of a highlighter, baby. But this mountain range over here, See that? That's, there's, um, this is the coastal plain over here. This is the, the Shvela, the Har, and this is the Sir African Rift, the, the Bika. Um, now, there's something important we'll see. When it rains in Israel, this, the, like it does today, the clouds come in, get their water from the Mediterranean when the water evaporates on the Mediterranean. When the clouds come inland, because all the weather is going always from west to east, it's going that direction all the time. So when they come in, they give off the rain when they get pressurized by the mountain range. As soon as the clouds pass the top of this mountain range, which is about 1,000 meters above sea level, somewhere between 800 and 1,000 meters above sea level, this mountain range, um, as soon as they get over the top, they stop giving off the rain. And that's why the whole area to the east of the mountain range is a Midbar, Midbar Yehuda. It gets some rain, but not nearly as much. Our mountain range gets about six, 700 millimeters of rain a year. The Dead Sea area gets maybe 100, 200. Rain starts picking up again when it gets to Jordan, when they get to the mountain range in, in Jordan. And that explains why the whole eastern side of this mountain range is a Midbar. See that picture? Now, our forefathers, when they come in, they're always coming from Mesopotamia. They probably come from the Golan or maybe from the Gilad. They start the mountain range from Shechem. They start in Shechem. They walk along the top of the mountain range to Beit El. Then they go to Hebron, and from Hebron they go to Beersheba. I want to explain why they picked those cities. Well, Shechem is probably the first place they come to. They don't usually stay too long in Shechem. Usually only, there's only trouble in Shechem. But why is Beit El the first place where Avram spends a lot of time and builds a Mizbech and calls out in God's name? Beit El comes up a lot. It's because of this valley over here called Emek Ayalon. You see Emek Ayalon? I'm going to show you a better map in a minute. Um, 
Let me let me switch to a different map now. My map 3D. This is with less pictures, but much clearer the, the idea of what I want to show you. Um, on this map, this smudge on the map is this international highway that connects between uh, Mesopotamia and Egypt called the Via Maris. I'm sure you've heard of it. If you look at this map carefully, you'll see that international travel went along the coastal plain, not, not along the coast because it's too much sand there, but about 10, 15 kilometers in um, along the, um, a little bit west of the coast, a little bit east of the coast. And then it can't go all the way along the coast because Mount Carmel gets in the way. So the main way to cut through is through Megiddo, opens up through Embikis or El, and then you go north around the uh, Kinneret, past Katsrin, and you're on the way to Damas Damascus into Mesopotamia. Another possible way to go is through the Negev, past Beersheba, and you go below the Dead Sea and go what's called Derech HaMedach through Jordan. But the main road was what's called Via Maris, the way of the sea. Uh, we'll see like in Sefer Bereshit, we'll see soon, caravans that were coming from the Gilad down to Egypt came along this road, down to Egypt. Most of biblical history is on the top of this mountain range. Why? Because people living on top of this mountain range are not bothering superpowers who control this highway. This highway is always controlled by a superpower, be it Egypt or be it Mesopotamia. You know, Egypt, depending on who the, um, which dynasty it was. In Mesopotamia, first it was uh, Aram, and later it's um, Ashur, the Assyrians, then there, the, later the Babylonians, then later the Persians, then later the Greeks. There's always a superpower who wants to control the road. Every once in a while, when the Jewish people are, are doing well and strong, we're able, even though we're most of our time are on the mountain range, we're able to go down and control the whole country. Then we're like in the time of King David and Sh Shlomo, and later during Achav in the Shabbat, we're able to control that highway. And that's what makes us great. <clears throat> but most of history, most of biblical history, we're on the mountain range. And therefore the cities where <coughs> our forefathers are, Shechem, um, I'm sorry here, Shechem, Beit El, um, through the Gush, through Hebron, down to Beersheba, that's the top of the mountain range or Highway 60 today. What makes Beit El a big city? Beit El is where Ramallah is today. This vadi called Nacha Emek Ayalon, which takes you right to Tel Aviv, that's the Ayalon Highway. That highway um, is basically Highway 443 today, the alternate route to Yerushalayim, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, and when the, when the highway gets into the plain, that's the area, over here is the area of Modi'in, or Latrun. That's why Latrun and Modi'in, part Canada, area of Amas, if you're familiar, that's why it's so important. But if you're trading, if you're living on the mountain range and you have goods, and you want to sell them, and you want a market that has a big demand, which is in Egypt, but you have a supply, but less people to sell it to, you take your goods from the mountain range, especially goods that grow in the mountain range that don't grow in Egypt, like good wines or spices and things like that, things that grow in what's called Eretz Carmel on the mountain range, you have a better market for them in Egypt. Therefore, people in, um, on the mountain range would travel down to the coastal plain to make trade. What makes big cities on the mountain range? Wherever there's easy access to the coastal plain. Therefore, if I take Imakai alone and take it to the top of the mountain range, it'll take me right to Beit El Ramallah. That's why the area is important. Same thing with Hebron. From Hebron, I have a direct route through Nacho Beit Gubrin, right to Ashdod and Ashkelon. That's why the city of Yavne, or ancient city of Gats, right over there. Yavne, um, <coughs> um, what's called Tel, Tel Morisha. Morisha used to be a big city. And later, if someone's going east-west, this way through the Negev, Beersheba will be the crossing point between the Negev road and going up the mountain range. So therefore, the cities where our forefathers were in were important cities because of their, ge because of their geographic location. Because their cities, our forefathers are living there, A, to make a living, and B, especially Avram and Yitzchak, because they want to make a name for God, you have to, if you want to make a name for God and bring this idea of godliness to other people, then you need an audience and you have to be living in a place where people travel and people are around. And therefore, Avram begins his career in Beit El and, um, and then continues from Beit El to Hebron and later to Beersheba. So it's simply when you, when you understand this mountain range, you understand all the cities of the Avot. Now, what I want to do in today's share is take a topic which could come up in a couple of weeks in Sefer Bereshit. I want to use this to explain Mechirat Yosef 
and the famous argument about who sold Yosef. And in light of this, we'll be able to, in light of the geography, we'll be able to take sides over who sold Yosef. So let me stop the question. Let me stop the share for a minute and ask you guys a couple questions. Um, if you want, you can answer in the chat, but you can just raise your hand and answer. If someone asked you who sold Yosef, what's the classic answer? Come on, let me give it a try. I mean, it's an easy question. The brothers, the brothers. And does that ever come up in our liturgy, like on Yom Kippur? With the uh, the ten the martyrs and replacing them. Let's say they say, hey, you know, you guys never paid the price for selling your brother. They quote a pasuk for Pasha Mishpatim, "Begonet ish macharo, din stab yodam mot yumat." And that's what your brothers did, and no one paid the price, and there were ten brothers, and therefore we're going to kill ten. That's a, I don't think that's very historical, but it's a beautiful, it's a very deep midrash that we quote. Um, now, did anyone ever hear of an opinion that the brothers didn't sell Yosef? Anyone aware of that opinion? Well, Danny has because he heard the share before. Okay, Peter. Yeah, yeah Peter. The Midianites yeah. sold him to the Ishmaelites. It was sold. Yeah, but who sold him to the Midianites? Were the brothers involved in the sale? Yehuda. No. no, no yeah. Who, basically, who had to report the 20 shekel on their tax return? Or who didn't report the 20 shekel on their tax return? If they were tax evaders. That's just a joke. Um, no, Steph, there's an opinion that they thought about selling him, but, but the, the Yishmaelites sold him to the Midianites uh, before they had the chance to. Before they, okay, so we have to see where that opinion is coming from. That's, that's the Rush Bomb's opinion. He brings that down. And he argues with everyone else for a change, but he claims that his opinion is a shot. I'm, I want to explain to you in our share now, we're going to read the text, try to understand what's the reason for the argument between Rush Bomb and everybody else about who sold Yosef. And I want to use geography and the map I just showed you to understand why I think the Rush Bomb is correct, okay? Ready? So let's let's give it a take. We're gonna read a little text first and then we're gonna have some fun. Let me just check the chat real fast. And Peter, okay. Uh, they said the series yes, of olive light and oil. And that wasn't my topic. My topic was the biblical history of um oh I'm sorry. Okay. I was the wrong uh I thought okay. Never mind. I think we mixed up topics, but I'll get to olive oil later on. But first, I want to get today the topic that I thought I was giving was the geography of Israel and how it affects our study of Brishit. But maybe I mixed that up. My mistake. Okay, anyway, um, this will be a lot of fun, and we'll get to the second topic in a minute. That was just from a question. Um, let's go back. I'm going to share my screen, and um, here we are. We need to go back to Ac Acrobat. Here we go. And I'm going to skip. I'm going to skip Yaakov's dreams for now. I mean, Yosef's dreams, but everyone knows he's dreaming and there's a big fight with his brothers. In fact, we talked about last week when I gave this show, we talked about how Yosef's dreams can be understood in light of Yitzhak's blessings to Yaakov and Esau. Let's start the story. The brothers go to see, checking the sheep. Now, we'll see in a minute that Yaakov is living in Hebron and the brothers are watching the sheep in Shechem. Let's read two more psukim. Whenever you have a little hineni, you know there's drama coming up. So Yaakov is sending Yosef to go check on his brothers. One more line. Here's our geography, got it? He sends Yosef from, she from Hebron to Shechem. That means the brothers are living, the family is living in Hebron, and they're watching the sheep in Shechem. If that's the case, how often do the brothers come home? How often do the brothers come home? Not very often. Definitely not every day. Definitely not even every week. Uh, it's a, um, if you know American calendar, um, they, they leave probably in September and come back for, for Thanksgiving vacation, if you know the college thing pretty much. That, that's a typical, they're not coming home every day, they're very far away, because even though by horse, maybe you can make it in a day or two from Hebron to Shechem, but walking with sheep, 
it's going to take at least three, four days, if not more, I'm pretty sure. You know, with, if you're grazing your sheep and you have a lot of sheep and cattle. Now, there's a bigger question. Let's take a look at the map again. I'm sorry. There's a bigger question. Why aren't they grazing the sheep where they're living? So there's lots of different reasons they give. Remember, they're over here in Hebron and they're watching the sheep down up here in Shem. Now, if that's the case, that's a good, like probably almost 100 kilometers, I think, at least. Probably even more than 100 kilometers from Hebron to Shem along Highway 60. But why aren't they grazing the sheep in the area of Hebron? So it could be there was a drought that year. Or maybe there's more grazing up north. There could be it's simply a practical reason for agricultural reasons. Or it could be they're not so happy living with their father. Now, we know that the brothers don't get along so great with Yaakov because Yaakov is favoring Yosef. And they're getting older. They remember their age now. They're, teenage, they're college age. Yosef's 17 in this story. That makes the rest of them between 18 and 24. So it could be they're simply going away for the whole grazing season for, for, you know, for a couple of months simply to get away from their father. Or it could be for regular reasons, for simply because there's nothing, not much for the sheep to eat and graze down south. Um, I, I keep on, I have to enter the people to the waiting room, one second. Um, waiting room, Friedman, okay. Back to, um, can I make, um, we're standing. I'm gonna take a break for a second. Uh, oh no, I can't make you co-host. Uh, never mind. Um, I think when people in the waiting room, I just have to let them in in, in between. Now back to, um, back to our class. So I want to explain what's important now is if Yaakov is living in Hebron and the brothers are watching the sheep on Shem, they won't come home every day, not even every week, probably only after a month or two they'll come home. That's going to be really key in the story. But remembering it's at least a, you know, a couple of days walk with your sheep from one place to the next. Let's go back to our story to the Psukim. Some, you know, he bumps into Yosef and Yosef is just wandering in the field. So whoever this guy is, this unknown person, asked Yosef, you know, you look a little puzzled. You're wondering, what are you looking for? And the famous line, I'm looking for my brother. And have you seen a big, you know, group of 10 shepherds with lots of sheep? And they said, yeah, I saw them. They traveled from here. Dotan is Emek Dotan is Janine today. Rabbi, you know? it would be nine brothers, not ten brothers. Nine brothers, correct. My mistake, correct. Yeah. Then how come why not ten? Yosef and Binyamin. No, Binyamin was too young to go out in the fields. So there's ten left, aren't there? I think there's ten brothers. Oh, Yosef. Ten, yeah. All right. Yeah. I'm not right. Sorry. Okay, it's okay. Now you're, uh, once again, you're right. Use your, fi- use your fingers. Okay. Yeah, that's hard, but I'm a, I'm a butcher. I lost one finger. No, no, okay. I just, I just remember that's, that. That's, I remember from the Haragim Malchut ahead of B10. I'm working backwards. I'm taking the Master on Yom Kippur and working backwards. Now, back to. Um, okay. So they find him in Dotan. Let's take a look again. Dotan is farther north, isn't it? I have another map over here. Um, here we go. Um, this is that highway we're talking about. Here's Shechem, and it's about 20 kilometers from Shechem to Dotan, if you see the map. And we'll see later, it's another 10 kilometers from Dotan north to Afula. But Dotan is at the northern edge of the Shomron Mountains. It's still in the mountain range. If you've ever been to the Gabo, you have a beautiful view from the Gabo looking south to Dotan. I see, Peter, you're a tour guide, aren't you? Don't, yeah, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. You go to the mountain up there, Harbar Khan, and you have a beautiful view of the area. It's just... If you go to Harbar Khan near Male Gaboa on the Gaboa, you can see the whole story of Yosef and his brothers perfectly. But that's for a uh, post corona we can take on Tulin. But notice, Bechevron is at least over 100 kilometers from Tishrem. The brothers get, are even farther away north. Now, let's continue our story. What happens next? They look at a distance, and before they get close, they, what do you call it? They plan to kill him. Now, how do they recognize him from so far away? They see some kid walking, but obviously he's wearing his coat, his special coat, so they can catch him right away. But by the time they see him, to the time he gets there, they have time already to make a plot. And this is happening before Yosef arrives. Listen to their argument. 
Yamru Ishalachiv. That's a great word. Ishalachiv, no, brotherhood. He named Baal That's the reason for their hatred. This dreamer, he's going to ruin our family. You know, he thinks he's king and everything. We have to get rid of him. And listen to the first, I call the plan A. This is the brother's plan. I call it first degree murder. Let's kill him. We're talking about how they're going to kill him. And let's take his body after we kill him and throw him in any old pit. Not a specific pit, in any old pit. Now, the Amarnu we're going to return to this in a minute. And then either Chumash is saying, or the brothers are saying, and we'll see what will happen to his dreams. Great, beautiful Machloket Parshanim, because it's because of this, his dreams came true. But this is classic um, irony in Chumash. In Pshat, they said it. Now, this will put an end to his dreams. If he's gone, he can't become, he can't become the only one. And he can't become our boss. Now, um, how are they planning on killing him? Why, why am I saying this is first degree murder? And what's the purpose of the pit? This, the, the, the pit is deception. It looks like he fell into the pit. You know, I, they had no forensic scientists then. I, I, I think almost the opposite. I think the pit is not, for, is not to make it look like he fell in the pit. It's to hide the body. Then why, why not dig a grave? Why not just dig a grave and bury him? Then you won't even know where he is. That's basically the same. I think it's the same idea. But why waste our time digging a grave? Just you know, throw him in a pit. In other words, they're going to throw him in a pit. And some, they're going to kill him, throw him in a pit. If the pit was near Hebron, I could say maybe, you know, they can blame it on that. But if the, if the pit they're throwing the body in is where? Is 100 kilometers away. No one's going to find the body and bring it to, to, to Yaakov. I think they simply want to bury the evidence. I'll show you why. What are they going to say when they come home? They're going to come home a week later, two weeks later, whatever it's going to be. Are they going to say anything when they get home and according to their plan? No. And if they came home with a dead body, they'd be self-incriminating evidence. But listen how terrible they are, what they want to do. They're going to come home and say nothing. What's Yosef going to say? And what's, I'm sorry, what's Yaakov going to say? Where's Yosef? And what are they going to say? I don't know. We never saw him. What happened? And Yaakov will say, I sent him to look for you. And they'll say, we never saw him. And therefore, what conclusion will, are we all going to reach? We're going to pin. We can say what must have happened. He must have been eaten by a wild animal. That's, the brothers are going to say, we're going to suggest that's the cause of death. But the, there's, no, there's no body. They're not coming back with a with a with a dead animal. If they threw him in a pit near Hebron, that's one thing. But they want to say a wild animal ate him. Now, basically, if that's the case, who's going to take the blame for the murder? If Yaakov sends him and he never made it to Yosef, if, if Yaakov sends him and Yosef never made it to his brothers, and he he's missing, Yaakov is going to take the blame. It's my fault. Yaakov will say. I sent this little 17 year old on a dangerous trip by himself. They're steady up in a way, not just to kill the guy, the brother, but they want to put the blame on their father. Now I'll say it, it could be, maybe they'll, what do you call it? They'll uh, maybe later on say maybe he fell into a pit. But I think it makes, I think the original plan is not to come home with the body, to hide the body and to say, and to accuse their father, it's your fault you sent them on a dangerous trip by himself. Now, I'll call that plan A, the brother's plan. It's not really that big of a deal because it never happens. Because they never, they never do this plan. But it's interesting, you're right, that the fact that it mentions a boar in the beginning will be important. Now, that's Chumash talking. Ruvain didn't do anything yet because Yosef hasn't come yet. So Ruvain hears the plan and this is Chumash introducing the topic and saying, Ruvain's gonna try and save Yosef before he arrives. And he says, what? Let's not kill him. We'll see what, what that means in a minute. No, Ruben's going to give a different plan. But it says, let's not kill him. Let's not, Lakot is assault. Instead, means don't commit murder. Remember that, that goes back to the Noach Elosh. Instead, listen carefully. 
השליחו אותו אל הבור הזה אשר במדבר. ויד אל תשלחו בו. That's the end of Ruvain talking. And then Chumash is explaining Ruvain's real plan is to come back and save him. Now, Dotan is not in the Midbar. Remember, Dotan is on the mountain range, north of Shem. Shem is not in the Midbar. But to the east of Shem and to the east of Dotan is a Midbar, the eastern slopes of the Gilboa, and a little bit lower down. If you, if you know the area, if you've been on the top of that mountain range, it's nice and green on top, but all the slopes going towards the east, towards the Jordan River Valley, are going to be dry because there's less rain. I'll go back to the map and show you like I showed you before. I'm sorry. All the map is right there. Um, I just need to switch PDF file. Um, this one over here. This whole eastern slope, you see it's all yellow? Right here, it's yellow. That's the Midbar. They're up here on the mountain range. But the Midbar is maybe, I, to, for example, you guys live in Baca or in that area. How far of a walk is it to Midbar Yehuda from where you live? All you have to do is go to Talpiot Walk from Talpio, one or two kilometers past Tor Bacher, or past the Diplomat Hotel, or past the American Embassy. Um, and what do you find? You should say consulate, now we can say embassy. As soon as you pass the American Embassy, a kilometer to it's all dry, isn't it? Look at the yep. view. Stand on top of Der Chabon and look to the east. You can see the view from everywhere. It's all dry because it's Midbar. And that applies to the area east of Jerusalem. It also applies to the area east of Shechem and east of, of, um, of Jenin. And that's a midbar. Now, in the midbar, you can graze your sheep, but you can't survive there. You, know, you can walk out there. Their camp is in Dotan on the mountain range, and they graze the sheep. Now, what's Ruvain's plan? He knows a good pit that doesn't have water. And therefore, what will happen? And it's probably a deep pit. If we throw him in a pit without water, we didn't commit murder. Why not? Because we didn't kill him. How is he going to die? He'll die from starvation. Within two, three days, if there's no water in the pit, he won't survive more than two or three days without water. So the plan is not to commit first degree murder, but tell the brothers, let's not like, take, to beat him up and to death. That'll be really hard for us. Let's do what we call grama. You know what grama is? Let's simply do, let's simply take him. And um, I call that, it's called grama, I call it, or second degree murder. Let him die in the pit. What's his real plan? Because it's gonna take a day or two till he dies. They'll throw them in the pit, and Ruvain will come back later and take him out of the pit, save him. How does, how does the Chumash know what's in his mind? Um, um, I'll ask you a better question. How's your, how does the teacher know what's in Ruvain's mind? No, I'm, I'm, somebody, I'm because somebody I'm, taught you this before. I'm explaining you have, you have Ruvain's, history. I'm explaining Ruvain's, I'm, I'm using logic to explain Ruvain's plan. But what's Chumash, Chumash is telling us, I mean, by the way, Chumash writes itself as an omniscient narrator ever since day one, ever since before day one, day zero. The, the style of Chumash, there's an omniscient narrator of the Bible who knows that, what he called, who knows what Esav is thinking about killing his brother, remember? Chumash can say, how, how does Chumash know Chumash has, is an omniscient narrator. It's coming from God. But when you read Chumash, pay attention, there's always an omniscient narrator in Chumash. Now, so for Chumash is telling us the reason Ruven is doing this, because he plans to come back and save his brother. Now, that'll get him brownie points back in the family. Remember, he lost his Bukhara because of what he did with Bilha. So maybe if he saves Yosef, he'll get on his father's good side again. Or maybe he's afraid that because he's the oldest, he'll be blamed for all this. Or maybe he's just a good person. That's also possible every once in a while. Sometimes people can just be good because they want to be good. But Reuven wants to bring, save Yosef. That's his plan. So they agreed to Reuven's plan. What do they gain? They don't commit murder first degree and they can all die. Now let's see what happens next. Yosef comes to his brothers. They take off a special coat. You know. They take him. Which bore? Not any old bore from the plan one, but a specific bore. The one that has what? The bore that's empty, that has no water. Meaning, that proves my point. If the pit had water, two things. He could stay alive longer. 
And if the pit had water, probably other shepherds would come to that pit to get water. If it's a dry pit, no one would go near there. And therefore, it'll be able, and it's in the Midbar. If it was on the mountain range, people could hear him screaming. The Midbar is a place where no one, people don't walk around most of the time. And the plan is he'll die, you know, after a day or two. And Reuven's plan is to come back. Okay? So they do Reuven's plan. What should happen now? Now they have to wait for a day or two until he dies. But they can just leave him there until he's gone. And Reuven's plan is to go back and save him. Now comes the most interesting part. After they throw him in the pit, they sit down for what I call a sudat mitzvah. They got rid of the bump. They got rid of the trouble. They sit down. I don't know if they made a motzi or not, but they, they sat down to a, uh, they sit down for lunch. Chumash doesn't tell us where they're sitting down to eat. Understand? But there's two possibilities. They could be sitting down to a meal next to the pit, in sight of the pit to watch over to make sure he doesn't get away or something. Or they could return to Dotan, where their camp is, where their food is, and where they've been living. Do you understand the two possibilities? We have to entertain both of them. But the brothers sit down to eat, it says so. We don't know where they sat down to eat, but either they're eating near the pit, where they're inside of Yosef, or far away from the pit, back in their camp or somewhere nearby. But wherever they're eating, keep those two possibilities in mind. By Suenehem by Yuru, they're somewhere high up on the mountain range, which would be fitting to the Geboa area. And they're looking, Vinei Orchat Yishmeilin Bamina Gilad. Here again, we'll need our geography. There's going to be a what? A um, caravan, Yishmaelites, coming down for the Gilad mountain range but with their camels, carrying lots of spices and things, trading goods on the way to bring down to sell them in Egypt. This is a, probably a regular, probably maybe a monthly caravan, which always went through the, area, the land of Canaan or the area of Canaan, taking goods from the Middle East on the way down to Egypt, where local traders would sell their goods to them. Now, <coughs> there in Dotan, let's go back to our map, our 3D map now, our, um, I want our topography map, that'll be a better one. They're up here on this mountain range, over here, I'm sorry, get rid of that. They're over here, and from here you can look at the Gilad. You see the distance from here to there? You can see the Gilad. Now on a clear day, Peter can attest to this, right? You stand on the Gabor near Dotan, and you can see the whole Jordan River Valley. You see all the mountains on the other side. It's maybe 30 kilometers away, 20. But you can see beautifully on a clear day. Right below is Ebek Beit Shan, right down in the valley. And you're not going to see an individual person walking, but you can see a caravan moving for sure from 20, from 20 kilometers away, especially on a nice clear day. So they see there's a caravan coming, coming down from the Gilad, but they're nowhere near Dotan. Now we have to know not only our geography, but also a bit of history. I'm sure you've been sometime in your life to the area of Afula or Ibik Israel. I hope so. Big white plain. That's important because it's the only big white plain and this, it's the big white plain that separates this mountain area of the Shomron and the Galilee. And let's go back to our 3D map. If I need to travel from, if I need to travel from, let me mark our thing here again. If I'm going to be traveling from the Gilad on the way to Egypt, I'm going to be coming down. I, I don't want that. I want a line here. I'll be coming down. I'm going to go through the valley and passing uh, the area of uh, Beit Hashita, if you know that area over there, passing Beit Shan, have to pass Megiddo through Vadi Ara and work my way down to Egypt. Got it? But caravans with camels do not walk through this mountain range. There's no way they're going to walk from here. They're not going to walk from here and go this way. You understand? They're not going to go that way. I wish I could erase that stuff, but I'll, I'll reload the map in a minute and clean it up. Um, in other words, the caravan of Yishmaelim, which is a massive caravan with lots of camels carrying goods, is not going to travel through this mountain range, definitely not through Dotan or through Shem. Rather, it's going to go through Emek Israel. And if um, Yudah is going to say, let's sell him, let's read down, let's read down and see what, what he says. What are we telling our brother? What's he assuming? 
that if Yosef it was in the pit, he's going to die. But it's still secondary. It's not first degree murder, but secondary murder. What do we gain by being responsible for his murder and, co- and covering up his blood by leaving him in the pit? Instead, let's sell him to the Shmeilim. But, and therefore, our hand will not commit murder. Why? Because still, he's still our brother, okay? And his brothers agree. Notice they're reluctant to commit murder, aren't they? They're, they're in a, a bit of a, uh, a, um, a quandary. Yeah. Why? We want to get rid of the kid, but we don't want to kill him. We don't want to commit murder, but we got to get rid of him. What do you do? So this, Yudas' plan is a win-win. We get rid of him. We don't commit murder. We might even make some, some money on the deal. And every, why wouldn't you agree? What would they need to do now to sell them to the Ishmaelim? They don't lift up their eyes that the Ishmaelim are not 10 meters away. That's what's important with the geography. When you read these Psukim, they lift up their eyes and what do they see? That's lifting up that's a long distance view. And they see a caravan of Ishmael coming from the Gilad on the way down to Egypt. If you know the geography, it's a long, it's a long distance view. And they, it's not the caravan is right next to them. The caravan is far away. What would they need to do? They'll need to take Yosef out of the pit and bring him maybe 10 kilometers to near Fula to meet the caravan as they're going through Amic Israel. Is that clear? Let me, let me show you another map here. Um, this one should do it. But we switched between tribes there, between, we have different people who actually bought them. But we, we didn't get to that story yet. We're going to see in a minute. Okay. But they're coming from the Gilad. Here, you see this map here? They're in Dotan, near Dotan. And the caravan is going to be a little north of like, going through Afula. I have a better view this way. Um, this view should be better here. They're coming down from the Gilad, let's say. This is the route of the caravan. Understand? Here's Shem, here's Dotan. The brothers are maybe somewhere up here with this area over here. But they're going to have to take him from the pit over here and go down, let me do it with a marker. They're gonna have to go down from here and meet them in Amik Israel, or maybe meet them over here in Beit Shan or somewhere. Something like that. Maybe they'll go, no, we don't want that. We want a marker again. But we're gonna meet them this way over here somewhere. Something like that. But, but they have plenty of time. It's gonna make, make an hour or two or three hours until the caravan gets to the, uh, to the area. But the most important thing is the caravan isn't passing by them. But they'll have to take Yosef out, Ruben out of the pit and sell him. Now, let's go back to our Um What should Ruben do? Put yourself in Ruben's sandals now. The brothers agree now to sell him to, to the, uh, to the Ishmael caravan. What are Ruven's options? Could he tell the brothers, oh, this is a terrible plan? It's a bad idea? Why can't he say that? He'll be killed or beaten up or overturned or whatever it is. It's one against nine other brothers. Not only that, but there's no logical reason to disagree with Yehuda. Ruven's real plan, this, this totally ruins Ruven's real plan. Agreed? If the brothers go through with selling and Ruvain's plan to save his brother and save and save his reputation, that's finished, isn't it? So Ruvain can't agree, but he can't disagree. Because if he disagrees, what will happen? If he disagrees, he'll be, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, but, but uh, Ruvain didn't know what's going, but Ruben didn't know what's going on. What do you mean he didn't know what's going on? It says later on, he came back to the pit. Well, we didn't get later on yet. <laughs> Wait a second. Hold on to your question. You're assuming that Ruvain went away. Yeah. You read Rashi. What's Rashi say? Rashi was bothered by your question. Where is Ruvain? Now, how does Rashi know Ruvain's not with them? Because, like, he, because he comes back to the pit and doesn't find him. So where was he? Remember what Rashi says? He went to learn with his father. Who remembers I love that? that. He started to learn with his father. Now, he, was learning, he, was, he was learning Rashi, Rashi with his father. Rush. What? He was learning Rashi with his father. His father, yeah. Probably learning Rashbam. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I heard there's another opinion that Ruben didn't join the meal because he was saying Tehillim. 
because 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 of his terrible sin with Bila, he was still doing uh, he was fasting. Now, I'm not I'm not sure which which of those options is more far fetched, but from a geographical point of view, there's no way Ruvain would go back to live with his father because it's a two day walk, three day walk going back and forth. Even if he had a camel, I mean a horse, he's not going to make it back in time. It's because it's 100 kilometers away, Ruvain's plan doesn't make any sense if he went back that night to learn with his father. You understand? Now, that Rashi is educational, isn't it? That Rashi is saying, even though the brothers were willing to kill Yosef, they still had kibbutz av. It's so typical. On the one hand, you honor your father, you learn with him, but you don't agree with him. It's, you'll do something really rotten to your father, but you're still learning with him. That's what happens when you're so sure of your hashkaf is right. You do terrible things because you're so sure that you'll say, because of your, your sinat chinam is so strong that even though you're mechabe kibbut av, you still do things that, which are terrible. I can bring lots of examples in Jewish history. Now, so again, I'm not sure yet where Reuven is, but you're claiming he's not there. I'm claiming there's no reason for Reuven to leave his brothers, isn't it? It's, according to Reuven's plan, there's no logical reason for Reuven to leave his brothers. There's no way, there's no reason why he would, unless he went to the pit, but he's definitely not by the pit. Now, it depends where they're eating. If they're eating by the pit, then for sure Ruvain's not there. You understand? If the person eating by the pit and the Shemitim come by while they're by the pit, then for sure Ruvain isn't there because you would have stopped them. He comes back later. My claim is, and we'll prove it in a minute, they're not eating by the pit. They're eating away from the pit. Now, let's take my assumption they're eating away from the pit. Okay? And Ruvain's with the brothers because there's no reason for Ruvain to live. If you were Ruvain, what would you do? You can't agree with the plan because why? Because it'll ruin your because it'll ruin your plan. You can't disagree with the plan because no one will agree with you and you might blow your cover. So think like a think with the Yiddish cup or a Gamar cup. What should Ruvain do to save his plan? Let me let me stop my share for a minute. Oh, is my question clear? I'm, I'm going to make an assumption that, and we'll try to prove it as we go on. The brothers are eating away from the pit where they can't hear Yosef screaming. Um, they're sitting down to a meal and they look in the distance and, they, and Yudah comes up with this idea, let's sell them instead. Ruvain can't disagree because there's no logical reason to disagree and that might blow his cover. You'd buy him from the Arabs, traders. There's Arab no Arab traders Arab. yet. Well, let's get them out they of They didn't pit. come yet. Ruvain wants to save him, correct? Mm -hmm. But he's not and he there. To his brothers. He comes back. He's not there anymore. So how can he say? Wait, wait. Ruvain. Before you're reading ahead, in real time, if you were Ruving and you're eating with your brothers, you didn't leave your brothers because there's no reason why you would. And you hear now they changed your plan. We just threw him in the pit. We left them there. We go now somewhere else to eat. Yeah. Yeah. So Phyllis says very good. The what she wrote in the chat is what should Ruving do? Ruven should volunteer, I'll go get him. Yes. Ruven should be the first one to the pit, say, I'll go fetch him from the pit to bring him to sell him. Or Ruven should leave and maybe excuse himself and say, I need the bathroom and, and run ahead to go there. But Ruven has to get to the pit before his brothers get there. All right. yes. but let me just summarize that. If the brothers are eating away from the pit, when Ruven hears the plan, he can't agree and can't disagree. The only thing he could do is volunteer, either I'll go get him, or he can say, excuse me, and go ahead on his own before they get there and pretend to, you know, pretend to leave or something. But Ruvain needs to be the first one to the pit to get there before the brothers get there to sell him, to take him out to the Ishmaelim. That's all. Now, keep that possibility in mind. If, if the brothers are by the pit, then there's no way Ruvain's there. And the question is, where did he go? So Rashi says he went to him with his father. He's fasting. He doesn't sit down to eat. But either way, it doesn't make sense what that he'd be away it doesn't make sense that he'd be away from his brothers and away from the pit. Now, remember, but the last thing we've seen the brothers, they're sitting down to eat, either away from the pit or, or next to the pit, and they have this great idea. Now let's read the next Pasuk. Now it's going to be fun, I think. Okay, so what should Ruvain do when we see? Okay, what are we told? What's that mean? Sochrim are merchants. Midianim are not Ishmaelim. They might be related, but Midianim are Midianites. They're, they're nomadic people. 
Bidyanim or like Amalek, they're, they're nomadic people. They're a little more honest than Amalek, but they're nomads. We know that from you know, the desert. We find them everywhere, don't we? We find Midianim, B'nai Kedem, they're always over the place. They're, type, they're a gypsy type population, but they're into Sacharim, they're merchants. Now, why would merchants be, tra- be walking on the way to meet a caravan? Because that's their job, isn't it? If this is a regular caravan that comes at regular times, so the Midianim happen to be passing by, and what do they do? They pull Yosef and pull him out of the pit. And they sell Yosef to the Ishmaelim for 20 kesef. And the Ishmaelim bring him down to Egypt. Got it? Now, there's two possibilities. If the brothers are away from the pit, what happened? As they're eating, coming up with this great idea to sell Yosef, what happens by chance? A group of merchants pass by. Yeah, now, how do they know that Yosef's in the pit? They didn't read Chumash. Hear yeah, why, why would why would Yosef be screaming from the pit? Of course, he's screaming in the pit, so they would hear him. Ah, they hear some kid screaming in the pit. What are they going to do? They're businessmen. Someone abandoned the kid or something. We can make money. We can do him a favor, save his life, and make money on the deal. So they pull him out of the pit and they take Yosef from the pit and they sell Yosef for twenty kesef. And they bring Yosef down to Egypt. Okay. Now. That's if the brothers are away from the pit. If they're by the pit, then it just so happens that it's Benim happening passing by when the brothers are sitting there and they do the, and what they wanted to do, they tell the Benim to pull them out of the pit. And then there's a lot of, uh, a lot of transactions going on. You know, they, you know, they pay the Benim to pull them out maybe and the Benim sell them to the, uh, to the caravan. They bring him there. Now, if Ruvain's away from the pit, as Phil has suggested, he should be the first one there. Let's see what happens. But Yasha Ruven alabor, Binein Yosef abor. Ruven returns to the pit. Yosef's not there. He rips his clothes. Look at the next line. By Yashav elachav. Look at these two lines. Someone tell me what that proves. By Yashav Ruven alabor, by Yashav elachav. Who's with them? He What's that proof? When, according to my question, where are the brothers eating? Near the pit or away from the pit? Away, away from the pit. It's got to be. Because if the brothers are by the pit, and Ruven was learning with his father or fasting, and Ruven comes back to the pit, he does have to return to his brothers. His brothers are there. But the way we explained it, the Ruven's with his brothers when they make the plan, and he should volunteer to go to the to board first. What happened next? Ruven returns to the pit. And, hey, Yosef's not there. Why not? Because... Ten minutes earlier, the Midianim pulled him out. He rips his clothes. Oh my gosh, what happened to him? He comes back to his brothers, and what does he say? By Omar, he's gone. And what's going to be with me now? Why? Because who are they going to blame for this? They're going to come home and tell Daddy what happened. Someone's going to squeal, right? And when they ask whose idea was it to put him in the pit, what would everyone say? It was, it was Ruben's idea to throw him in the pit to die. That was the official position, wasn't it? So now Ruben's going to have to take the blame because it was his idea. No one knows his secret plan. So now the brothers are stuck. What do they do now? He's gone. What do the brothers assume? What, what do the brothers think happened? If they're away from the pit. They have no idea what happened. So what's the only logical explanation of what happened to him? Killed by an animal. Exactly. The same, that's the irony. The same thing they wanted their father to think erroneously, got it? They wanted to know he's dead and make their father think it was his fault. Now it's happening. The same thing happened to them. They have no idea what happened to him, but now they realize it's their fault because a wild animal must have eaten them. Now we'll see what they do in a minute. Now, let me, I want to share with you the Rosh Bam. Where's the Rosh Bam? Here, listen to the Rosh Bam. We have time, yeah. Here's the Rosh Bam in this Pasek. Okay. Listen, this is what Rosh Bam says. As you're sitting to eat bread, What's Rosh Bam saying? Remember my question, were they eating? The Rosh Bam the Rashbam doesn't share with you the whole, the, thing, the whole share I just did with you. He takes for granted you, you did that analysis. And he reaches what conclusion? 
they must have been sitting far away from the pit. Why, and why would they do that? <laughs> it's so great. That's such a great line, isn't it? That's not shot of the Pasuk. That's beautiful irony, isn't it? I mean, beautiful satire. Remember, you don't eat after killing your... The Pasuk is, it means don't eat before doing shkita. I mean, before bringing the Qur'an properly. But the Bateh Adam, he's saying, no, don't kill someone and sit down to a meal. So stay too far from the pit. Now, he doesn't know the geography, though, and they're waiting until the Shemitim are going to come by. Remember, they saw him from a distance. Now, um, but they're away from the pit. Listen. Before the Yishmaelim came, Midianim came by. And what did they do? They saw him in the pit, or they should be, they heard him from the pit. They got there first. Isn't that just what we said? Now, the Rashbam doesn't bring any geography into the story. Agreed? All the other Parshim disagree with him because they're not aware of the geography. I'm using geography to explain Rashbam Shita. And a careful read of the Psukim of Vayashav El Abar, Vayashav El Achav, and a bit of logic in the story. But when you understand the geography, it supports what Rashbam is saying. Now, I, why does no one agree with the Rashbam? I could, I could agree with the Rashbam. The problem is when Yosef um, makes himself known to his brothers in Parsha Vayigash, what's Yosef say? Ani Yosef Achichem, Asher, Machartem Uti Mitzrayma. So how, you can't argue with the Pasuk. Yosef says, the brothers, you sold me down to Egypt. And, you know, this, this is the problem in the, in the Rashbam Shita. And because of that Pasuk, what Yosef says, you sold me to Egypt. Therefore, they can't accept Rashbam. Okay. He's saying, you didn't send me, but you caused me to be sold. I'll explain what Yosef's thinking in a minute. Because we have to di differentiate between what Yosef is thinking and what the brothers think. Okay. Now, so he's saying, I'll return to what Yosef, why Yosef said that. Uh, but put it this way, Yosef thinks his brother sold him. Do you understand why? Yosef meets his brothers, they throw him in a pit, 10 minutes later, Midianim pull him out and sell him. What's Yosef assume? His brothers are behind it. It's a logical conclusion. And what proves that no one, no one came later, and no one came later to save him. He was sold by his brothers. Or it could be, it was, it was it was it could be Yosef thought they were just teasing him. Remember, remember Yosef has no idea his brothers wanted to kill him. Yosef doesn't know Chumash either. Yosef has no idea his brothers wanted to kill him. They don't know the brother's first plan or Ruven's official plan. He just knows they came to throw him in the pit. What's he assuming? They'll come back in an hour or two and teach him a lesson. When I was young, they used to give kids like that a pink belly in camp. Well, there, was a, there was a camper who did something bad. Remember the good old days when, when you could do, uh, when people were more violent and teachers used Don't to get- like Yeah. So when someone did something wrong, you taught the kid a lesson. You beat him up and- he knows not to do it again. So what's Yosef think? The brothers don't like him. Yeah. They don't like this cattle tail coming. So he came, they threw him in a pit and we'll get him later. He's assuming his brothers come back in an hour to get him. They think he threw him there to die. And what happened in the meantime? In the meantime, <coughs> someone else takes him and sells him. But Yosef has no idea his brothers wanted him dead. Anyway, so what's he say? Whenever Rashbam says that, he's arguing with his grandfather, right? He says it several times. He says, that's Pshuto Shemikra. And I simply wanted, in the share, I wanted to use geography to explain what he means by Omek Pshuto Shemikra. And this all happened by chance. Okay. So that's the, um, that's right. Now, it also explains why the Torah goes into detail about Soch Midyanim Socharim as opposed to the Shemelim. <laughs> I saw you. The other opinion, if you want to say that the brothers did tell Yosef to Ishmaeli, that the brothers sold him, so then you have to explain that they used the Midianim to pull him out of the pit. They needed a rope or something. But you know, he says, if you, if you, those, but he has to say that 
He has to explain why the Torah tells us the detail, be then Sakharim coming by to pull them out. But he thinks the best, the, his first thing makes more sense. I'm just using um, um, geography and understanding the topography of the land to explain what happened, to explain why Rashba makes more sense. Now let's go back to the Psukim and we'll see one more problem and then we'll go back to what Yosef thinks. Now, now the brothers, now, Ruvain tells his brothers, What did the brothers say back to, to Ruvain? They don't say we sold him, do they? They don't say anything. Now, I'm going to bring one more proof. Later on in Parshat Miketz, yeah, in Parshat Miketz, um, the brothers go down for food for the famine, right? Remember? And Yosef sees him and he remembers his dreams. What does Yosef accuse his brothers of? Who remembers? Let me mute everybody real fast. Okay. And I'm muting and now you can answer after this, okay? What is, um, what does Yosef accuse his brothers? Spies. He spies. He spies. Now, he's up to a plan. If you're being accused of a spy, and what do they claim? We're not spies, we're brothers. How can they prove their innocence? But under interrogation. So what happened? We know that he interrogated them, didn't he? Right. But when you interrogate people who claim to be spies, how do you interrogate them? You don't interrogate them as a group. You divide them into different groups, don't you? Individually. Yeah, that's, of course he did that. Now let's look what they say under interrogation. Let's open the Psukim. What parak is that? That's going to be, um, oh, that's too big one. Here, we'll take this one. Perik, it's in Parshat Miketz, so we're going to be around 41, maybe. Um, that's Paro's dream, probably 42. Okay, yeah, they're coming down to Egypt. Okay. Um, what happens? Right there. Right, do I have it there? Yes. Here, but I with them. Oh, I'm sorry, beforehand. Here we go. Here we go. Vice Court, Yosef remembers this room. Do I remember love, 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 um, I'm sorry, Yosef sees brothers. Okay, but Nakar Lehem, but Yomer Lehem. He says, work for Meretz Kanan. Okay. By Yomer Lehem, Raglim at them. You guys are spies. Got it? And they say, no, what are, we're what are you call? We're just brothers getting food. Listen what they say. Kulanu bnei isha haranachnu, kenim anachnu, levedachem raglim. And he says, no, you guys are spies. Got it? Listen to the information they give him about the family. And they can't lie under interrogation. You understand? This has to be what they know. What do they say? How come they said eneno? That's all they know. One's missing. One brother is missing and one brother is gone. Now they were stupid. What should they have said? They should have said, why give any, if they're together, don't give any information. Or, don't, or say they're both missing or something. But they can't lie. And therefore, what do they say? They don't say one is dead. They say one's missing and one's by his father. But they can't be lying. So that's another proof that the brothers don't know what happened to him. And then he gives them the proof. Now, what does Yosef think? Again, in my opinion, Yosef for sure, his brothers were behind the sale. Either they caused him to be sold by accident or they wanted him to be sold. But he has no idea that they wanted him dead. Now, what can the brothers do now? They have no idea what happened to Yosef. He might end up coming home, but they'll find out soon if he got home or not. And when they get home, they'll find out if he's home or not. When they come home, what's their father going to ask? Where's Yosef? What are they going to say now? They could say, what do you got? We don't know. But, but they really don't know. Now, there's, in psychology, one of the worst things you could have is called a missing person. But usually, when they tell you in psychology, um, a parent with a missing child is worse than a child who's, who's dead. But not knowing what happened, and you, what's called, you need closure, you need to see, you have to have a funeral or something, you need some proof that the person's gone. Because if in the back of your mind he might still be alive, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible thing. Now, what do they want to do now? Now they're thinking it through. We don't want the father, they don't want the father now to suffer so much. 
and they want to convince their father that what? That he's gone. What do they do now? They have a new idea, which is almost ironic. Let's take a, let's take a quick read. Okay, what they do? By Chulik Tonit Yosef, they took his coat. By Shkutu Sirizim, remember that every time Amiso brings a korban chatat, it's because of this pasuk Sirizim. It was it's remember the sin of Sinat Chinam. They dip Yosef's coat. Ramban brings it down right here, and they dip Yosef's coat in blood. In the blood. Now, if they bring Yosef's coat with blood to their father, won't that be self-incriminating? They're not going to bring it by themselves. What are they going to do? They send it to their father with somebody else. Words, they can't bring it. I'll prove they can't. they're not bringing it. They're sending with someone else to bring it. And whoever brings it, brings it to their father. And they tell their father, they tell Yaakov, whoever these people are, we found this. Now, that question, do you recognize this code? Is it your sons or not? The brothers aren't going to ask that. It's obvious they know it's his code. An outsider is going to say, oh, I found this nearby. Do you recognize this code? In other words, they're sending someone else to show Yaakov the code so that Yaakov on his own is going to reach that. In the original plan, they were going to come up with this idea of Chaya Rachalatu. They were going to say that. Now Yaakov Rabbi, himself says it. Rabbi, who's who's, who's this coat? unknown person that's bringing the coat? Yeah? Who is it? Who's the, it's who's the I unknown mean, they know person? People. They, they have friends. They hire someone. That, how they do it, I'm not sure. But they, they can definitely something that's doable. And they say, do you recognize this coat? And, and what's Yaakov say? Chaya Rachalatu. Toraf Toraf Yosef. Yaakov on his own now reaches the conclusion that he must have been eaten by an animal because he sees that the, 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 the um, they, they weren't thinking so far ahead in the first time. They were thinking quickly then. But now they want Yosef, they want Yaakov, the father, to have closure. Now we have a coat with a, with a, uh, with a blood stain on it. And the logical conclusion is that's, that's not incriminating evidence, but that's evidence that he's gone, that he's dead. And therefore, the brothers are going to come back now afterwards to try to comfort him, get over it. Like, cry, Yaakov, Simulotav, Yaakov rips his clothes, puts sock on his, you know, covers himself in sackcloth. He's in Avelot for many, for many years. Everyone comes to try to comfort him. By mainly Nachem. You're getting over it. By Amerki, Ereda, Bini, Avashola, Vev, Kotavid. Remember, we did last week about the Bechira process. That's a sign to him that God, the God's not with him. He's not the chosen son. It's over. Remember, he's unhappy with his sons, with everything, and he can't get over the fact that Yosef is gone. So that explains why Yosef doesn't fulfill his nether. He doesn't, he's, the rest of his life, he's passive. For the next 20 years, he's totally passive. And, you know, the, the brothers take over everything. But he just says he's living in, in, um, in mourning his whole time. Now comes the problem. What's it say next? What's that imply? It wasn't the Ishmael, it was a Midianim. So maybe it's all the same people. The weeks made the Midianim are what? Are the merchants. And, it's, and the Ishmaelim are the caravan. In other words, the Midianim is Amazon and, and the Ishmaelim is, is UPS or FedEx. Okay? But to solve the problem, you read the first line of Paraklamatet. The USA for Mitzrayma. The Ishmaelim did the delivery. The merchants, who did the sale? The Midianim made the sale. They made the 20 shekel. Who made the delivery charge? That was the Ishmaelim. Understand? The Midianim sold them by way of the Ishmaelim to Potiphar. So the 20 shekel got back to the Midianim. But the Midianim, but the Ishmaelim were the ones who delivered the package. So they bought him from the Ishmaelim who were working uh, for, the, for the Midianim. And that explains the, um, that, that solves the problem. But then it explains also why we have the three different groups involved. The Midianim are the local merchants who found him and sold him. The Ishmaelim are the, are the, um, transport. Who, um, who did the transport. So that, that's what I try to do with you is try to show you that when you look at the geography of the area, 
you get a better understanding about who Sod Yosef, and it makes the story so much better. And the, all these years, they have no idea what happened to Yosef. It explains a lot of things. Had the brothers known he was sold, and they saw their, their father suffering so much, what could they do? They could go back, go, go down to Egypt, look for the caravan, try and find him. You can travel to Egypt. It's a known caravan. Maybe they're going to go look for the kid, search for him. And I think Yosef is assuming that's what they're going to do. Remember, Yosef thinks the brothers were behind the sale. So the brothers don't go search for him. Had, had, had the brothers known that they sold him, someone would have broken and told Yaakov about it. Yaakov would find out and Yaakov would say, go find him, go back and get him. Or maybe on their own, they'd go back and get him. No one goes looking for Yosef. They have no idea he's down in Egypt. Yosef thinks the brothers know he was sold. And Yosef is expecting the brother's going to come home and his father's going to find out what they did. His father's going to find out that Yosef was sold by the brothers. Understand? And then Yosef assumes that his father's going to get angry and tell them, go back and find him. And within a year or two or so, someone's going to come and rescue him. What happens instead? They don't no know right? he's there. So for Rabbi Yolbanun has a great article on this. He claims that Yosef thought that he was sent away by his father. No, it's not that his father sent him away, but Yosef, knowing the Bechira process, just like Ishmael was sent away because he's not chosen. Remember the dream? Is it? We talked about that last week about there going to be one matriarch for patriarch, and the argument is who's chosen, Leah's kids or Yosef's kids? Rachel thought it was, I mean, Yaakov thought it was Rachel's kids. Therefore, Yosef is the, Yosef and Benimir are the two tribes, and Yosef is going to be the Bechor. And the other ones are just, are, are, are out of the family. And, um, and Leah's kids think that they're chosen. Now, now that Yosef no, is, was sold, sent by his father. Remember, Yosef sent by his father. As soon as he gets there, they throw him in a pit, and then he's sold. Maybe his father's behind it. Again, Yaakov wasn't, but Yosef has reason to think that. And Rabbi al uses that to explain why Yosef doesn't write home. It's a beautiful article he wrote like 30 years ago, maybe more than that already, of why Yosef doesn't write home. He's, he's a big shot in Egypt. Why isn't he writing home and telling his father I'm alive? He's sure that he was kicked out of the family and his father sent him out. Only when his brothers come and bow down to him and he realizes, oh my gosh, they don't know what happened to me. Then, you, oh my gosh, now he understands why his, father, why his father didn't go and look for him. And now he's all angry why he didn't write home. That's why he starts crying all the time. He has, it was a, it's called a tragic misunderstanding. But if you follow that, then it's a really cool, that makes the story even better. You know, as Yosef thinks, he was sold, but the brothers have no idea what happened. It explains almost everyone's behavior. And it was a, um, but Yosef never knew that the brothers wanted to kill him. It explains why Yaakov doesn't do anything. It explains why the brothers don't go to save him. And the brothers, why they're so startled when, hey, it's Yosef all along. But Yosef thinks that he was abandoned. Um, in fact, he says, do you remember Gugunav, Gunav, I was stolen. He told us the guys, the butler and the baker, that I was stolen from Eretz Canaan. No, you know, I shouldn't be. I shouldn't. I shouldn't be in heaven in the first place. So that was the other side of the story I wanted to add, and just one last map which I didn't get to. Um, here, between each of the Mesopotamia, remember the land of Israel is located here. The two centers of civilization, Nahar Mitzrayim over here, and Nahar Prat over here. Those are the big centers of civilization, and that highway goes in between them. It goes from here. I'm sorry. That highway goes in between along the coast of Israel. That's the Via Maris. But um, we can get rid of that. Uh, but that's why our borders are located. The land of Israel is located. If we're chosen to be a nation, to make a name for God, our location will be important in that uh, as we can have an effect on other countries because we're near uh, we're near that highway that connects the two civilizations together. That, the, the, that, the, the, that, that highway was called important. the Spice Trail, Rabbi. No, that, the, that the Spice Route is down here. The Spice Route is going through the Negev down to... Uh, sorry? The Spice Route is this one. If I'm saying it takes the spices from the Negev. I'm sorry. It takes the spices from the Negev down to this way. Down to Saudi Arabia, this way. And oh, them that's the Spice way. Trail? But, the, spice, but, the spice route with Shifta and all, all the all the Khanim and stuff like that is through the right. Negev and the Sana. That's the spice trail. That's the spice trail. This the Via Maris is the main hub. No, the spice trail is going to connect to the Via Maris. 
but the spices are going to be sent down down to um not just to egypt but down to saudi arabia and stuff is that is that the other is, is that via also the fertile crescent yeah this is the fertile crescent up here that's the fertile crescent oh sorry get that back that's the fertile crescent up there that, this is the euphrates that's the Hudecca, the tigris this is the persian gulf and this is either bavel ashur paras um, aram but someone's always controlling this area which is the cradle of civilization and that road connects that cradle with the cradle of civilization in egypt anyway so our time is up and um so i want to share with you simply because you like the land of israel we don't have to live nowadays too much but i want to share a little geography to help understand what happens in sefer Brishit and how we can use geography to understand a great machloka between rashbam and his grandfather and we can say with Rashbam that he didn't realize had, 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 the, had the Rishonim been on Tulim in Israel and known the topography, they could have understood the sugi a lot better. So Bar Hashem, we have that opportunity nowadays, at least we used to, you know, to go on Tulim and see the places. <laughs> hopefully, and, uh, hopefully one day they'll come back again. Yeah, one day, well, hopefully within a couple of months, we'll be back to normal. Anyway, thank you everyone so much. Have a good Shabbat. And uh, happy Hanukkah. Americans who celebrate Thanksgiving. Yes, you can. Thank you very much. We don't say hello. Or maybe Chatsi hello. Okay. <laughs> with the bracha or without a bracha, Rabbi? <laughs> um, with the bracha on Thanksgiving? Yeah. First of all, I'm a Canadian, so it does, I, I've already it done it. Yeah. So Republicans with a bracha and, and Democrats without a bracha. Yeah. I'm glad you're not political. Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay, everyone have, have a good week. Can we get a link to the recording, please? Yeah, they have that on the website. They're um, on the Tormit Seal website. There's a recording with all the shearing. What What's the URL of the website? Uh, just do do Tormit Seal, Mizrahi Tormit Seal, do a search and you'll find it. Uh, it's on uh, it's on the channel of YouTube. Channel of YouTube, Lilmod.org. That's the O U O YouTube. On YouTube, yeah. Uh, uh, the name of the channel, lilmo.org. Lilmo.org. Okay. Mm -hmm.